All right, guys, welcome back, EYL. We are back home, and we got a special episode. Anytime yes. we get to talk about fashion, it's always a good energy, good this, conversation. This is the byproduct of dripping responsibly. For sure. This, these type of things happen. For sure. You get to the highest level. For sure. <laughs> For sure. Brandis Daniel. So I actually spoke at our event at uh, New York Fashion Week last year. Yeah. When we did with um, United Masters and Ally, and uh, that was a legendary situation. So... You are the head of Harlem Fashion Row. Yep, right? absolutely. And um, have done major collaborations. Nike, obviously we just talked about the LeBron sneaker. We'll, we'll go into detail about that. A native of Memphis, um, author. You brought us your books. Yep. Thank you. Plural. You're welcome. Plural. <laughs> yes. Um, family yeah. woman, you just said you dropped your, your child off to your daughter? I got a daughter, a seven-year-old. Well, actually, dog, she just had a birthday, eight years old. Oh, okay. yep. happy birthday, yeah. yeah. For sure. So now you live in New York, started in Memphis, but now you're a Brooklynite. Yep. So a um, little change of scenery, colder weather. Big change of scenery. <laughs> 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 um, change of scenery but yeah but it's, it's a lot to talk about you know we love to talk about fashion and entrepreneurship and working with corporates and challenges and different things of that nature so i'm sure we'll have a very insightful conversation so thank you for joining us yeah. thank you for having me like i am so inspired by both of you um, and what you built with earn your leisure i'm mad i didn't make invest fest because i was preparing for new york fashion week but Everything looked incredible. And thank you for inviting us to the show. No, thank you for coming. It was an amazing show. A lot of honorees were there. Yeah. Kelly Rowland, our boy Johnny Nunez, shout out to him, a legend. Uh, it was well put together. ASAP Rocky. ASAP Rocky was yes. honored that night. Yeah, it was a, a beautiful evening in, in Harlem. I love it. it thank perfect. you. Yeah. I'm so happy y'all were able to make it. Thank you. So, all right. So, let's for people that don't know, um, what is Harlem's Fashion Row? Yeah, Harlem's Fashion Row. We're a premium agency based in New York City. And our goal is really like, how do we become a bridge between designers of color and brands? And so, we do that through a number of different ways. We have the events like the one you guys came to in New York. Uh, we do that through collaborations. We just dropped a collaboration with Abercrombie & Fitch, which I'm actually wearing Fire. underneath this dap jacket. Fire. This is the dap jacket here, but everything else is Abercrombie & Fitch. Um, and then we also do HBCU. We work with HBCU fashion departments as well, like trying to get them to the place where they can actually compete in this industry. So, you know, it's all about like, how do we continue to elevate black and Latinx designers? That's okay. the goal for us. So we got the Harlem Fashion Room, but the journey starts in Memphis. The journey starts so in Memphis. So there's a big gap in between. <laughs> How do we get from Memphis, Tennessee, shout out to everybody in Memphis, to coming to New York with this this vision, this, this thing that you want to create? So I always wanted to do something in fashion, right? But back then, there were no shows like Project Runway. There was no Project Runway. There was no America's Tech, uh, Next Top Model. I grew up in the 70s. So people were like, go to school, you go for a doctor, lawyer, you know, all the traditional careers. And so when I went to school, that's what I went for, pre-med. Ended up changing my major to fashion merchandising. Um, eventually, after college, got a job in Memphis, which is a long story, but got a job in Memphis working for the only buying office there. There was a store called Catherine's, which is a plus size women's store that was there. So got that opportunity actually got offered a job by one of my vendors from New York because we bought underwear from um, a vendor in New York. They offered me a job. That's how I got to New York. So, uh, and how did you start the Harlem Fashion Row? So I went to a show in Brooklyn. It was at like this small restaurant and I'm sitting there with a friend and I'm watching the models go down the runway. And at the time, me and my friends were throwing something called a hottest Harlem house party. So I was also throwing Harlem brunches. So I was already throwing events in Harlem but never thought about doing anything fashion related until I went to that show in Brooklyn. And I'm sitting there and I don't know if you ever had this happen, but like you get like an idea or download and it's like, you can't even think about anything else because that idea kind of takes over. Um, that's what happened that night. I'm watching the show and I'm like, you need to do this in Harlem. And while I'm watching it, like I literally see this event happening in Harlem. That was in May of 2007. And because I didn't know any better, I, put the event for August 2007. <laughs> like a few <laughs> months later, I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, did that event, but during the planning of that event, I was like writing in a journal all of these ideas I had for what this would be. And um, yeah, and that event happened. So, you know, it wasn't perfect, 
by no means. Nothing about it was perfect, but I always say like that was the most magical event I've ever done because to see an idea that you have come to life. And I'm sure when you guys started Invest Fest or when you started this podcast, like to see an idea, like a physical representation of that, there's nothing like it. Yeah. You, you sketch it in your mind and it comes to life. Yeah. And so at this time, is it just you? Are you looking for people to help you? Is this a solo mission that that event that you're putting on? And you said it wasn't perfect, which is great, but that's part of the story, right? So what are some of those things that you saw like as you start putting on more events, wait, what was I thinking? I oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, how much time you got? You know, when I first started, I didn't, I always brought people on. Like I was always about like, how do I get as many people to help me with this as possible? So the first person I brought on was somebody who did PR. I didn't really even know what PR was, but um, this woman had just started her own agency. I'm like, can we, can you come on and do the PR for this event that I'm doing? And that, actually helped us get, we got written up in uh, Women's Wear Daily, which in fashion, that is like the business publication that you want to look at. All like retail CEOs in fashion read Women's Wear Daily. So we were in Women's Wear Daily, a small, small article, but I'm going to take that. And then we were on style.com that very first year. And after that, one of the things, things that I did was I was like, how do I build community around this? So I started having luncheons and breakfasts and dinners and all stuff that I was self-funding from my nine to five to bring a community around HFR. So my first like advisory board member was Audrey Smaltz, who owns the ground crew. My second advisory board member was uh, Michaela Angela Davis, who was an editor at the time at Essence. And I started bringing like the Bevy Smiths and uh, the Julie Wilsons and people to like kind of basically I knew that I needed people around this who was champion this in order for it to work. So you talked about the working with black brands and corporate. Mm -hmm. So for people that's not even in the fashion world, why is it important for black brands to work with corporate? And what's the disparities from black brands working with corporate as opposed to white brands working with corporate? So 2009, I started to look for black designers to be a part of our second show. I couldn't really find any black designers. So naively, I said, let me go to the department stores where we shop. I'm going down the list of all the designers on the department store website. Mm -hmm. Realized that less than 1% of the designers that were on those websites were black. Then I went and said, well, how much are we spending on apparel? In 2009, we were spending $22 billion a year on apparel product. And I'm like, wow, this is not matching up at all. Like, how do we represent less than 1% of the designers, but at the same time, we're spending all of this money on apparel. And at that point, I was like, how do I start to get more designers of color into department stores? And that was hard because for the first 10 years of HFRs, retailers really didn't, retailers and brands they weren't the ones really rocking with us. It was like brands like Verizon was sponsoring us or AT&T or Pandora Jewelry or Prudential even was partnering with us. It was really difficult for us to get retailers. And so now I'm like, the more we can partner brands up with retailers, what it does is, A, when the, when the designer comes on board for a collaboration like the Abercrombie and Fitch one that I'm wearing, they can come in and they can just design. They get paid a rate that is fair for them. Um, they can come in and design. They don't have to worry about doing all the things. All the infrastructure is there for them. They don't have to worry about the manufacturing of it. So it's a win-win for both the designer and also for the brand because they get to tell this designer's story and they get to tap into our culture. So like what designer is that? The, the Abercrombie and Fitch. This is Nicole Benefiel. So she was one of the designers that we showed. Um, she was the first designer that came out okay. of the show. In okay. September. So so Nicole Benefiel has her own She has company, her own thing. Her yep. own fashion line. Mm -hmm. So she works with Abercrombie. Is it just Abercrombie or is it Abercrombie slash Nicole Benefiel? It's, it's. I wish I had my jacket. Okay. Look, I feel like showing you, <laughs> showing you my tag. <laughs> um, so on the label, it has at HFR, Abercrombie and Fitch and Nicole Benefit. Oh, so it's everybody. It's everybody partnership. on the label. And then that helps her 
explain how that helps her grow yeah her so it exposes her to a whole different audience right so now nicole benefield so abercrombie and fitch is sending out marketing emails about nicole benefield to mm. all of their their audience right their email audience um people are also learning about their, their her story because they did a lot of storytelling in the marketing of it so it opens her up and you know she also gets paid for yeah. that this just feels like when we talked to Steve Stout, what he was doing with corporate and hip hop, where it was he was merging the two. It feels like it's a similar story here where you're merging fashion with corporate in a sense. How do you find the emerging talent? So like, Nicole is incredible, right? But yeah. I'm sure as your brand grows, people want to be in front of you. So how do you decide and how do you identify the next emerging talent to say, all right, this is worthy to be put with a brand? Yeah, so we have uh, an online platform called Designers Raw. So any designer can go to our website, harlemsfashionroad.com. And once they are in our database, they get invited to be a part of Designers Raw. So really, it's very organic. I have a team. My team is always scouting new talent. So Nicole Benefield came to me through, you know, someone who I knew who was like, hey, you should check out this designer. Um, I'm always looking for who is a designer that I feel like has like a new perspective, like somebody who's bringing something new and interesting and has like a very clear aesthetic of, of, of like what they're what they have to contribute to this industry. Um, and then what I also loved about her in particular was that she was her, she was her vision for where she was going was so clear. Mm. Um, when you look at her aesthetic from like, we showed her collection last year too, 2022. So when you look at her collection from 2022 to 2023, it looks like it's just an evolution. It didn't like, it wasn't like one person here and then a whole different kind of ball game on this side. Um, her vision is really clear. Her aesthetic, I think, is something that the industry needs. She is a just a dope human because um, we're also, we only work with dope humans. <laughs> With good character. So it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, and so we knew when Abercrombie came to us and was like, hey, we want to do a collab with HFR. Like we either sometimes we'll give a brand like three or four options. That's what we did with Nike and LeBron. Actually, we gave them three options and they were like, we can't choose. So we're going to choose all three. Mm. With Abercrombie, we were like, here's the option. She's the one. And they were like, we trust you. How how was social media? You said you started in 2009 with that vision. At this time, Facebook is prominent, but Instagram isn't yet. There's no social media. Thank God there was no social media. How, how has that changed, <laughs> I guess, the work that you're doing, right? Because I feel like everybody now has a lookbook on Instagram. It, de it definitely changes. Like, I'm able to see designers. I'm able to literally go to a designer's uh, Instagram page and, like, walk into their world, like, quickly. And I can tell so much just by scrolling up. So... Okay, so what is the problem? Why is there not a lot of black designers? What's the what's stopping um, black designers from becoming mainstream or penetrating that market? Less than you said, one percent of the money from black people go to black designers. Yeah, you, when you think about the designers who have made it, and is that right? correct? You said one percent, less than one percent. It's of, maybe three percent now of the money that black people spend. On clothes. No, less than one percent of the designers sold on major department stores website. Okay. Do you know how much percent black people spend on on apparel? On like black designers. Out so of here's interesting. I don't know how much they spend on black designers, but McKinsey released a study. So by the year twenty thirty, we're gonna spend black people are gonna spend seventy billion dollars a year on apparel. The other thing that was interesting about that study is that black t black people are three times more likely to switch brands if it's a black founder or black created brand. That just really happened, I think, after 2020. I feel like after 2020, we all were like, if we're going to make it, we got to take care of ourselves. Mm. And so with that, though, that's a huge, um, I think, opportunity for brands is a huge opportunity for an investor who wants to really invest in black brands as well, because consumers are now ready to shop the black brands. But the challenge is we don't have the infrastructure. So imagine if we had like an LVMH, like a holding company, an LVMH or a Caring or a Tapestry or, you know, an authentic groups type brand or something like that, that was a holding company that provided all of the infrastructure for black designers. Like, think about that, mm -hmm. right? 
and they provided all the operations, the manufacturing partnerships. That That's what we've been missing. Like if we had that, the opportunity for black brands and where they could go is is really limitless. What we've been missing really is the funding, the infrastructure, um, the operational capacity, the manufacturing, it kind of you address those things, like there's no limit to how far we can go. And it's kind of crazy that no one has really seen that as an opportunity. Well, I think Kanye spoke about that. That's when he was, I want to go back to that, but before we, let's go, let's talk about this then. When Ye was like, um, he didn't have the infrastructure, mm -hmm. pretty much paraphrasing. And that's when Sway, that legendary conversation with him and Sway. Um, that's what you're referring to? Because LVMH, everybody hears about LVMH. What exactly does LVMH, what do they do? Cause we know that they own all of these luxury brands, but you said a holding company provides infrastructure. So what exactly does LVMH do for all of these brands that they own, have ownership in? They provide the revenue for those brands. That's a big piece of it which then allows them to be able to do proper marketing. Um, and also allows them to tap into LVMH's infrastructure. So what is that? Like accounting, uh, manufacturing support, um, operational support. Like those are the things that a lot of times smaller brands are struggling with. Cash flow, you know, which is a problem for all small businesses. You don't have to, th imagine if you could just go create, um, and 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 do the things that you actually love in a business without having to worry about all of the business operations of what it takes because that's what takes small businesses out it's the cash flow it's the you know um, the accounting piece so it's, was jay was jay correct in his assessment but i feel like yay also could have could have did it that. Did yeah it. absolutely so in a sense because even the lvmh it they have a bunch of companies but there's really like probably five or six that account for most of the revenue. Absolutely. For, I mean, Louis Vuitton is like their number one the brand. Number one by yeah. far. Yes. Right. And then there's like 40 other brands. But yeah. They don't generate as much, not even close. Right. right? right. And so it, it can offset some things as far Absolutely. as infrastructure. I'm, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like let's just use Harlem Fashion Row as the holding company for black brands in mm -hmm. a sense where Telfar can exist under the Nicole Benefit. They could all exist under there. Yep. And then we can grow together. I feel like what we've seen, especially from our designers, is very individualistic right it's like i mean we can use sean jump by itself Fubu yep. by itself yep but there's not one piece that holds it all together to say let's build so we can have an lvmh type situation yeah absolutely like if you look at the fact that tapestry just bought capri holdings right right that's going to make it one of the largest you know fashion conglomerates in the u.s if it hasn't already done that um so if we had that, even if we started with three brands, it would it, it would it would be building upon something that could be like a legacy, like a huge legacy brand. Um, I just see there's a lot of opportunity there because consumers are ready. Consumers are ready to shop black brands. Yeah. It goes back. I mean, it's part of that that process of us trusting each other. Yeah. And having partnership. Yeah, so absolutely. I, do you feel like what you're doing now is setting the trend for that because you are finding brands right now it's partnering them with with corporate but at a certain point it, do we lean toward more of that all right let's have create this infrastructure i would love to with the right investment it's gonna take a lot of money but not a lot like 10 million 10 million yeah that's it 10 million to do what to build that to, i think to start it to start that infrastructure but to then, start, so then like there, that. there comes a thing where it's like um fabrics even fabrics right and this was like when yay i was talking to somebody and they was like when they went to milan mm -hmm. and they was like it, it it was hard for people to fully understand what yay was talking about but it was like like even the fabric is different like you got to actually go to italy to actually have access mm -hmm. to the richest level of fabric um so it's it's almost like a monopoly that the fashion houses have um which makes it hard especially like to grow like a luxury brand yeah there's always a way to get around stuff and there are so many different fabric manufacturers in the world you're talking about the world like there are so many fabric manufacturers in the world and a lot of that stuff is built on relationships so you know but who who has the resources to go to italy stay in italy for a bit and build the relationships with the manufacturers 
not a, not a lot of black designers have that opportunity. Well, that's what I'm saying. So that's yeah. that, so 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 it's like all right, Virgil, right? He was somebody that had a um off white. Yep. But and then Dap had raised questions about off white, like is it a black owned was it a black owned brand? But now it's like all right, well if you get help from the outside, mm -hmm. you they have resources that you might not have. Right. So as a black owned company, like I feel like how far can you go if you're just always just one hundred percent incubated as just being black? That's a great question, Rashad, because our community would throw, we throw each other under the <laughs> bus for getting outside investment. And shout out to right? Dow. Shout out to Dow. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying that that's what, that was a, a conversation. That's what he said. That was a topic. So. Definitely shout out to Dow. Um, I'm actually representing Dap today. I was I like, let me, oh, yeah. let, me <laughs> let, let me bring him in the building with me. Um, we got to get over that though. Like in order to grow and scale stuff, we can't say, you know what? We're, we're not able to grow as big as the other brands, but the other brands were willing to take investment. And sometimes that investment, you know, like for example, Tommy Hilfiger, when after he went bankrupt, he partnered with a factory overseas. That was his main investor, right? Um, that's how he was able to bring his brand back. And so we, we have to allow people to grow. Our community, we have to allow grand, brands to grow. And sometimes that's gonna mean that you're gonna get investment from people that's not like you. But at the end of the day, if you can grow and 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 do your thing, look at, think about the opportunities that they can open up for so many other people. Mm -hmm. Like we can't keep stunting our growth by saying the only way we're gonna grow is if I get money from a black owned. So, so how do how do we, how do we create that evolution? Because I feel like for our brands, there's like a time limit. There's a time stamp on them. It's like you're going to be hot for five to ten years, then it's over, and then there's a new brand. So how do we manage that level of consistency? Like I like what you said about when you watch Nicole's look. You said that I could see the evolution. Mm -hmm. So that's important because we we need to have something that's sustainable, like a Ralph Lauren or a Tommy. These brands have been here for decades. How do we get to that point like for us? We, we have to be willing to give up equ some, some equity mm -hmm. and we have to be willing to bring in some investors because it is very hard to grow and scale without capital. And so many of us are, are, you know, designers will say to me, I can't get anybody to invest in my brand. And I said, oh, how many investors have you pitched? And then they're like, they're like, oh, I sent this to one person. And I was like, well, you can't send your deck, your investment deck to one person and then say you can't find investors. Or send me your investment deck. I actually know a couple of people who might be interested. And, you know, we we have to do what we need to do to get what we need to get in order to grow. That's kind of follow up with that because that's interesting because I don't think we've ever talked about what does that pitch look like from the fashion world? We know in the world of business, there's like you got to have these things when we're yeah. trying. Is it similar or are there some it's, nuances that that you have to have? No, it's similar. Now, I will tell you, fashion businesses are harder to get investment for because people don't feel like it's as sure as like a tech company. Um, but I think that if you can show your community, like you have a much more um you have much more of an opportunity to actually get investment if you've got a big community so like some designers like hanifa like she has a huge community of like black women i mean she's killing it and shout out to her um you know telvar has a huge community so there are some people who got huge if you can build out that community piece i think you can really approach the investment like any other business would there's another woman i'm thinking of my wife buys all the time my stuff is in target Finoel. Oh my God. Yes. So the community. <laughs> Finoel, you know, she was one of the designers on the sneaker. We, I know. I yeah. can't remember the name. <laughs> yeah. We actually ran into her. Okay. By mistake on the street. Yeah, and she's so Fee is so dope. And she has a store now in Brooklyn too. Yeah, I know. I, I can see my charges. <laughs> <laughs> I can see them. <laughs> it's an investment fee. Exactly. It's an investment exactly. fee, Troy. <laughs> and there's also like, um, you know, you look at like Milano. Mm -hmm. So my heart, like, you know, she built a great following. So it's like, I think proof of concept, it's like any business, like you got to yep. have traction. Nobody's going to invest in a business if you have 
a thousand followers and you sold 10 t-shirts like it's too risky like right said, it's, it's, but if you can develop proof of concept but the hardest part is to actually get to a point where you're already successful so what would be some tips that you would give to some because everybody wants to do fashion mm -hmm. usually they start with like t-shirts hoodies yep. sweatsuits it's like easy to produce that type of garments or hats stuff like that what would your advice be for people that want to start a clothing business i think first like have a really clear vision you know, like no, not just where you want to start, but where you want to end. Like, where do you want to land? Who do you see your brand sitting next to? Because that is like the number one question always. People want to kind of know, like, where do you want to fit into the market? Um, I think having that clear vision also helps you decide like what you take on and what you don't take on, what partnerships you take and what partnerships you don't take. Who do you actually give your product to and who you decide not to gift it to? So I would say start with the vision. Um, then I think building out a community is like so important, like that community piece. I mean, that's how we've grown HFR it has been our community. So building out the community piece is really important because uh, you need somebody to sell to. And a lot of times designers spend a whole lot of time designing product that they love and they have nobody to sell it to. Mm. And um, and the third thing I would say is like build relationships with the fashion industry, because whether you love it or not, like it th those are important relationships to have how did you build your community yeah so again like the the my community when i first started was really built by doing lunches brunches i sent cupcakes out all the time to people um i sent personalized cards out to people all the time i researched when people's birthdays were and sent them books um, I was really, 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 as a matter of fact, I was working, I worked with Steve Stout's agency and the way I started working with them, they brought on my first sponsor was by sending a cake to the office. I sent a whole cake to the office. And my strategy was when this cake is in the office, people are going to say, whose birthday is it? And then they're like, it's nobody's birthday. Well, who got, who brought the cake? Carlos Fashion Roll sent the cake. And I knew that that would be the story around the office. So it's like, how do you do things that are just different to kind of like get people talking? Um, in terms of the, like the fashion insiders, that was, you know, me reaching out, cold email. I cold emailed um, Stephen Cole from the, C the CEO of the CFDA and asked him, hey, will you come do a conversation with me in Harlem? And he came in Harlem and we had a conversation at the Schomburg, um, you know, well, 2020 happened and then a whole lot of people <laughs> started to reach out. You know, I, I, uh, that was when I built my relationship with Anna Wintour was in 2020, but that came through the relationship with Stephen Cope, who I had reached out to seven years earlier, you know, so it's, it's, um, not being afraid to reach it, to reach out to people and to kind of meet them halfway. What was that like the, the conversation with, with Anna Wintour, who was looked at as, you know the person when it comes to fashion everybody knows her from from all her work in vogue but what was that like for you coming from memphis building this brand and having that moment so i've never told this story but i got a call from anna winter's office on a saturday morning um it was the morning of my sister's wedding and i and i wasn't ex expecting it and um, the first thing she said is, I told her, I was like, oh, it's, you know, my sister's wedding. And she's like, what are you wearing? <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> Good question. Uh, but they end up, her and the CFDA end up giving a million dollars to our nonprofit that we started in 2020. Um, but that first conversation with her was actually a real conversation because at the time there was so much going on, like George Floyd had just been murdered. Companies were finally saying, wait, we don't have any black people in our office. Like, are we doing enough? Um, so it was a really, probably one of the realest conversations someone has has had with, with someone like her. Um, but we had a real conversation. We talked about like what she could do um, from her and we did some things with some HBCUs through her team at the time. And um, and then what was crazy, though, was in 2021, she showed up to our fashion event. We held it on a street in Harlem. Nobody knew she was coming. And so she pulls up on the block on 137th Street to present the award to Carlos Nazario, who is um, an incredible stylist. And the whole block, people were like, is that <laughs> Anna Wintour walking down 137th Street? Uh, but that was like a huge moment for us.
a really big moment for us. And we had it, we did the fashion show on the stoop of my apartment that I used to live in in Harlem, where H actually the idea for HFR was Bert. So she's standing inside the apartment and I was like, Anna, I need to get a picture of you inside the apartment because this is like a full circle moment. And she's like, it is? She was like, it is? I was like, yeah. And so we got the, I got this photo of she and I inside that apartment, which I'm like, I keep that. It's actually up on top of my desk. Oh, dope. So yeah. let's talk about the collaboration with Nike, with LeBron. Yeah. How'd that come about? So 2017, our 10th year in business, hardest year ever. I thought every brand was going to want to partner with us and like, come on board. Really, no one did. It was really, really tough. Um, I lost money that year put money on my husband's credit card. It was a whole situation. And I kind of said, you know what, if I do anything next, I want it to be a real collaboration with the product. But I didn't know like how that would come about. But I feel like words have so much power and intentions have so much power. Um, so September was our event that was really tough. In November, I did an event in Memphis because I've committed to doing something in Memphis every five years. I feel like you should always give back to where you came from. And after that event, I got an email from someone who said, hey, there's um, an athletic company that wants to do something with black designers. That's all I can tell you. I'll send you over. If you're interested, I'll send you to NDA. And I was like, sure, I'm interested. I know my mind was not thinking in a million years that it was Nike. So the NDA comes through with a swoosh on it. And I I was like, wait, what? I didn't send it to my attorney. I just signed the thing and sent it back. And then the next day, I'm on a phone call with the brand manager for LeBron at Nike. And it just felt so unreal because I was just in this place of like, man, I don't even know where to go from here. And now I'm on a call with the brand manager from LeBron. And she's talking about the fact that LeBron was like interviewing on this bouncy ball in the Nike corporate offices and they were calling him the strongest. And he was like, no, I'm not the strongest. Black women are the strongest. My mom is the strongest. And they decided there was a woman there who worked on his team, a black woman who was like, I want to do something with that. And that was how that sneaker came about. And so um, she was like, just send me over some designers that we can potentially work with on this sneaker. And I created a whole deck for them. She was like, just send me an email with their websites. And I was like, nope. <laughs> so I told their whole stories, three designers told their stories, why I felt like they resonated with what he had said. Um, and they hit me back and was like, we can't pick just one designers. We've like printed out the deck you sent. We put it on the wall. We want all three. And we were in Portland with about 20 people from their team, maybe two weeks later. Hmm. So and the, that was so how that sneaker so started. So it was three different versions of the two? It's two different versions. Yeah. yeah. It was the white one, uh, yeah. kind of the off-white one, and then also a Citron, like so a yellow one. they together or? Yeah. So when we had the meeting um, where we talked about, you know, well, so, so here's what's funny. So we go into this meeting because me and all the designers were at like just a really low place in our lives and in our businesses. I was like, we're going to go in here and we're going to be fully ourselves. Like we didn't dress in Nikes. We dress how we normally dress. We were the most dressed up people in Nike. Uh, but I said, we're going to go in here and be our full selves and we're going to tell our real stories. So we got in, we tell our stories and the the Nike, the woman from Nike was like, all right, let's get ready to, you know, talk about this project. And I said, you know what? We're excited to hear about this project, but we just told y'all our stories. Like that's deeply personal. And we don't know anything about you guys. Would you be willing to share your stories with us? And they, um, Liam Merritt started off. You guys know who he is? He was the one who like signed LeBron and found him when he was 13. He's like the OG at Nike. Mm -hmm. So Liam Merritt started the story off talking about when he was in Kansas City. He was a little boy. He was poor. He used to look up at the airplanes and say one day he would be on an airplane. Then Ted, who works with Lynn, went next and he's talking. And then we get all these stories. So by the time we actually get to the project, we're so connected because we know each other at that point. And so when the designers go in to design, it's literally like looking at magic. 
I was sitting back there with the team and we're just looking at them just go for it. One of the most amazing experiences of my life was watching them co-design that sneaker. Did, uh, was there a reaction at, so when Bron actually saw the shoe? Yes. How was that? So when LeBron actually saw the shoe, we met him in New York. He saw the sneaker. You see the, um, the bracelet around it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the designers actually designed that so that you can wear it around your wrist or you can wear it as a choker. Ah. And so, um, when we were telling the story about the sneaker, one of the designers said, LeBron, the sneaker is amazing, but I want you to know outside of the sneaker, like because of this collaboration, we built this incredible sisterhood. And people talk about black women not being able to collaborate and that we're always in competition, but these are my sisters now. And he looked at them and he was like, that's the story I wanna tell. I wanna tell that story. And then when they showed him how the bracelet went around the, the wrist and the, and the neck, oh God, he went nuts. He was like, wait a minute, people about to be wearing my logo around their neck. So it, it was a really, really dope moment, but he was so intentional about the story that was told around the sneaker because the fact that it involved black women. You spoke to him? Yeah. How was he at work? He was very nice and we honored him that year. So we actually launched a sneaker at our event in 2018, um, honored him that year, got a chance to um, dress Savannah uh, for that event with Kimberly Golson, that's a designer that she wore. And um, Maverick was there, Rich was there, um, his whole Nike team was there, his, his Savannah was there, his Gloria was there, Zuri was there. You know, the whole team. Uh, the whole team. Yeah, they, the they, were, they were all there to see him um, accept that award, which was really dope. Yeah, and the truth has been successful uh, as a sneakerhead. I was not able to get my hands on them. It sold out in less than five minutes. Which makes that tells you how <laughs> great the shoe is, and it still has held its value. I think even yeah. now it's still selling on 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 like StockX and Goat for like yeah. seven hundred, eight hundred dollars. Yeah. Which furthermore lets you know how great the shoe is. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. So you have partnerships with Nike. You said Arrow Combi, Timberland. How do you? go about finding the right strategic partner for some of these brands. Cause every brand is not going to fit what Harlem fashion Row represents and right. it won't, you know, fit what the designer represents. So how do you go about doing that? Yeah. Sometimes, you know, the brand, sometimes the brands will reach out to us. Sometimes we reach out to the brand. Um, I think when we have that first conversation, we usually know our team know, like, are they about, about this life or are they not? Um, you know, do they really want to support black designers or, you know, not really. Trying to meet a quota. Um, so so we we usually know in like that first call, like, is this something that we want to move forward with? Um, and then you know, following our instincts on that sometimes is hard because we've also turned down really, really big lucrative deals. Um, but following our instincts on that, we've had like successful collaboration after successful collaboration. Like, this one is doing really well. The Abercrombie one right now. Um, we did one with Banana Republic a few years ago with um, designer Charles Harbison. That one beat all gross margin expectations by three digits. Mm. I can't give you the exact number, but blew it out the water. Um, and so, you know, collabs have been major for us, and I think a really great opportunity for the designers. How does that work strategically without giving specific numbers, hypothetically, right? Yeah. I have the brand, I have the designer, we have your company in the middle. Yep. How does that work? Do they say this is a number that we're willing to pay to have the brand inside and that happens and do the sales dictate, you know, the amount of royalties that people get? Like, how does this yeah. work? Yeah, so, so we always wanted to be like transparent. So HFR gets like an agency fee and we get a licensing fee if they use the HFR logo on it, right? Um, but then we negotiate the designer's fee separately because we always want like whatever needs to go to the designer needs to go to the designer. So we work that out with the designer. Sometimes we come to the table and the brand will say like, this is our number and we like know what that number is. But in most situations, we're able to go to the designer and say, do you feel good about this number? This is the number we wanna go to the brand with. So once we do that, the brand then, you know, it flows through HFR, but the designer gets the num like their whole number. We don't take anything from that. Then HFR charges our agency fee and then we split royalties. So you wrote a book called um, Small Business, Big Partnerships. And 
it talks about how to attract, secure, and maintain partnerships with big brands. So can you give us some insight on how to attract, secure, and maintain partnerships with big brands? Absolutely. Um, you know, the sponsorship deck is so important, like what you send out to brands. The other thing that's so important are relationships. What, what should be in a sponsorship deck? So when you're sending out a sponsorship deck, you're basically saying, so think about this. I want you to think, when somebody gives you a gift at a party, and you see a gift that's like wrapped in this like beautiful wrapping paper with this bow on it. You assume that that's a nice gift. If you got a gift, you get a gift in like a brown paper bag, you're not as excited about that until maybe you look in and see what it is. Mm -hmm. So really your sponsorship proposal, your deck, your partnership proposal, it's like basically like how you're wrapping your company. So I always say people like, I know Canva is great and people love to work in Canva, but like get a professional graphic artist to design your sponsorship deck. And in that deck, you want to try to keep it to like 10 pages. You want to include like, you know, your company, what you're doing, your audience, because at the end of the day, brands want to connect with your audience. The reason they're going to partner with you is because they think that they can get more business by working with you. They're going to get more business by working with you through your audience. So you always want to like make sure that your audience is highlighted, who they are, what they do, um, how they connect with that brand as well. And then any photos you've got from like recent events or partnerships that you've done, really important. Any press that you've gotten, you want to include that because you're basically saying to a brand like you want to have a conversation with me and here is why. So you're building credibility with that deck. So once you and then, of course, in that deck, if you want to, you don't have to, though, you can also include like here's how you can work with us. So you may say, let's say if it's an event. You can sponsor an event at this level and hear all the things you get and you can put pricing in there or you can not. I don't really like to send pricing out on our first decks. I prefer to like, I'll put like, here are all the things you get, but I don't really like to talk pricing yet. Why is that? We, cause I mean, we, we've been in this that space where we've got conversations. Should we send it out with the pricing or should we send it with, <laughs> yeah. that, with it? And it's kind of like, it depends. Why don't you do that first? Because it's different. When I get on a, you know, you see in a deck, that's just you know, uh, uh, it's just a document versus me getting on the phone with you, giving you, showing you a video. Like I always show videos on our call, showing you a video of like, this is what the experience actually looks like. This is what it feels like. And I'm telling you what it is like that. People underestimate human connection. And if people get on the phone with you and they're feeling your vibe and they're loving what you're talking about and they're seeing the video and they're excited, cited it's a different conversation now pricing may not matter as much mm -hmm. because now i've built this connection with you and you know i said the second thing is like that connections piece like a lot of times people think oh i'm just pitching a brand you're not just pitching a brand you're pitching john at that brand or paul at that brand or sarah at that brand like it's that person that has to want to partner with you so what, what inspires you to create this masterpiece was it after years of seeing this or being to ask the same questions having trials and tribulations i got to put something together yeah so i um i wrote a book i actually did there's a, this is actually a follow-up to the first one i did a book called sponsored when i was looking to get sponsorship for our events i really couldn't find the information like it was all very generic nobody was really telling me like what to do how it worked it's very like a secret agency society in knowing how to partner with brands and i'm like there should be a book out that just tells you how this works like because if you go get a brand partnership that doesn't take anything from me right so like how can we all win um, and so this was really the follow up to that because I wrote that book in 2017. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest partnership I had had that at that time was probably like maybe $150,000 for something. Um, we far surpassed that since then. And so I really wanted to write like a follow up to say, here's all the things I've learned since then. So how, what's that transition like from getting the single year sponsorship to getting the multi year? sponsorship mm -hmm. because we all try to get to that space where it's not just a commitment for one year yep. um, our brand our audience has now seen you they're familiar with you what happens next uh, yeah how do you follow up and, and create those relationships i i think it's a conversation with the person at the brand you know and saying hey we really want like a real commitment 
And, you know, we appreciate your one year commitment, but like, let's lock this in for three years because it also works for the brand. It also guarantees that, you know, you're not partnering with one bank this year and then another bank the next year. Like there needs to be some consistency. Um, it's not a good look to me for the brand, for you guys to ha open yourselves up to competition coming in. Um, so I think having that conversation with, with the brand is like, it, having like, like saying that, like, I want to make sure that you're secured so that we don't have to go out to your competition. Also, I want to make sure that like there's consistency in our messaging going out and we can see year over year um, how we're doing. Uh, brands are open to that. So um, who's some of the biggest brands that you work with, like on a consistent basis? Uh, some of the biggest brands we work with on a consistent basis is Nike. We worked with them for the last five years. Um, they've sponsored our designer retreat that we host in New York City at their corporate offices every year. Um, we've also worked with LVMH now. I think we're going on your, t we have a three-year partnership with Tiffany and Company um, for some HBCU work. Um, the Virgil Abloh Award, they're committed to that year over year. Um, we've also worked with Macy's for a number of years now um, on several different projects. Probably they're like our longest standing partner. We probably work with them for maybe eight years now. Um, you know, we're building out a solid partnership with Nordstrom now as well that we're really excited about. Some really cool things coming down the pipeline there. Um, trying to think of who else. We're working with Saks Fifth Avenue. We work for th with them for a few years now as well. <clears throat> so a lot of uh, several retail brands. And so that's the lifeline of the business is the corporate relationships. Yes. Yep. So have you seen the impact like post George Floyd of companies that's like reneging from or cutting back money? I mean, we we're, we're all seeing like three years and I think we all knew that it wasn't going to last. Right. Um, but what I can say is I think companies are streamlining the amount of like partners that they have. And thank goodness, like HFR is one of those partners that they're like, we're going to continue with. Um, but yeah, they're definitely pulling back. There has been, um, especially the luxury brands in particular, mm. uh, the luxury brands in particular, like they came out hard in 2020 and they've been really soft over the last two years. Yeah, um, that, that's been pretty consistent. Yeah, um, so it's same in your industry. Um, similar. Yeah, very similar. Um, uh, but you know, I'm asking these questions because we're seeing these things. Yeah, right? so it's interesting to hear from your perspective and obviously a different industry, but similar scenarios. Yeah, but you uh, guys have like such a great audience. Like, appreciate that. They should be like knocking your door down. That's what we say. <laughs> <laughs> they should be knocking your door down. Like if I had an opportunity to come to Atlanta and talk to what is it, twenty thousand people? It's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah. I mean, seriously. Yeah. I I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a no brainer to me. Makes Can sense. we clip that up? Uh, <laughs> let, let, let's talk about fashion and color. Um, because I think just the title alone is incredible, but what it represents is being seen. Yeah. Uh, so talk about that because I, I mean, again, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible piece. So when people think about our contribution to fashion, they don't really know like the fact that like Jay Jackson was the first American couturier in Paris. People don't know that, that was a black man. He worked with Christian Dior. He worked with, uh, I believe it's Yves Saint Laurent as well. Um, they don't really know that right now this year we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the ballet at versailles which was this competition between like french and 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 american designers and stephen burroughs was the only black designer a part of that people don't even know who stephen burroughs is um our history in fashion hasn't been captured in a book since 1982. in 1982 a woman lois alexander lane wrote a book called blacks in the history of fashion you can't buy the book because I bought all of them. <laughs> there were only like 10 on the market. I bought them all um, because I want to make sure they were in safekeeping. But, um, you know, we don't really have our history preserved in fashion. And so I kept saying, we need a book. Like, so that 50 years from now, 75 years from now, it's like registered with the Library of Congress. We can always have our history captured. People can always like look in this book. So this is actually volume one. Um, a fashion and color. And so it's black designers A to Z. Was it like a lookbook? Open it up. Yeah, yeah. Open it up. 
Yeah, so so how uh, this is volume one. What years do it, does it span to, or is it up to current? Day? So so this is actually current designers. Okay. So it's actually um, thank you. You're welcome. So this one was actually um, uh, dedicated to the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Yes. We gave five mics. You guys know about the source. We gave five mics <laughs> to Dapper to Dan and Misa Hilton. Absolutely. And then we had, there's a black artist, uh, her name is Ashley Buttercup. She illustrated, she actually painted, these are all oh, original so like paintings. Every, verse, yeah, every So every letter, there's a designer for every single letter from A to Z. Mm -hmm. um, Olivier Rusting from Balmain wrote the foreword to the book. Okay. And so it's like, it's a coffee table book, it's a reference book. If you look in there, you'll see that there's a QR code. So the QR code takes you directly, there's Fee Noel, okay. your wife's favorite designer. That's going on a coffee table. <laughs> That no, page so. right there is going on the cover table. Show them okay. Listen, listen. Can we, is my camera tied? <laughs> Come on this. Listen, Fina Well, I appreciate all the garments lift that it up, lift to it the bottom. Cover my whole face. I don't care. <laughs> Listen, everything that you contributed to my household, I want to personally thank you. Uh, I want to personally thank you for making my wife feel happy in your clothes. And every time she wears it somewhere, people stop her to ask where she got it from. So I just wanted to thank you. And uh, you're being, well, this is like you're immortalized, right? Like you're yeah. out of this yeah. historical document. So Absolutely. Shout out to you. Uh, but people can like scan the QR code and it takes them to the designer's Instagram page. Incredible. So they can actually shop Straight well. through the book. Straight through the book. That's the whole book. Yeah, that's fine. So yeah. What, what's your favorite time period of fashion? Oh, man. I think the 90s. Uh, I love the 90s. I love the 90s because we had so many black brands out then. There was, you know, the FUBU. There was a Nietzsche. There was Sean John. There was, like, man, if we could replicate that right now. We spoke, we, spoke about, we spoke about this to Dapper Dan, and he was saying that um, there's, not, there's never been black luxury designers. But I forgot that there actually is one that people overlook. Christian Louboutin. He's black. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. You didn't know that? No. He's a black man. Did you he's know that? Telling me something about it. Yeah, so yeah. So he I, I actually he was at um he's a black man. Okay. That's, that's first. But he actually came uh to Saks Fifth Avenue. Oh wow. So my mom worked for Saks Fifth Avenue for okay. thirty years and then my wife ended up working there. Okay. He, uh when they turned the seventh floor into the shoe. Uh, level at Saks Fifth Avenue. They didn't know who he was, though, right? They didn't know. She didn't know. Wow. I'm like, no, that's him. <laughs> wow. He came in to open the store. You kind of favor each other almost. Wow. He could be your dad. <laughs> I never knew that. Yeah. yeah. We shop with him a lot. Dang. All right. Y'all know. know my pants. Now I can feel struggle. better about <laughs> <laughs> my Louboutins. <Exactly. laughs> Support black business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Little, little known fact. I love that. I was uh, at an event. It was like a, a footwear event, and Idris presented the award to him. Mm. And they had like a really dope relationship. But now I know. All right. Who knows? Y'all put me on. Might be at the I appreciate that. old fashioned road yeah. next year. But so, yeah, but I mean, that's still, <laughs> exactly. that's still an extreme outlier. But so when we talk about black brands, we always talk about like, quote, urban brands a lot. Mm -hmm. But so. We had an interesting conversation with Dapper Dan about um, why there hasn't been luxury brands, yeah. and he had his own opinions. Why do you think there hasn't been uh, black luxury brands? I think luxury is built on heritage, and we haven't really had a brand around long enough to build the heritage. That's, no. you know, so you think, you know, the luxury brands in the traditional sense of who we know, like they've been around for 100 years. We've not had now we've been around for a hundred years, but we've not been able to build a brand that is around for a hundred years. Like even if you look at who the oldest female designer is in the United States, I haven't been able to find anyone other than Elizabeth Keckley. Elizabeth Keckley designed for Abraham Lincoln's wife. She bought her and her son's freedom through design. She is the oldest designer that I can find in the U.S. And, you know, and so imagine if she had a kept that collection because everything she was doing was luxury. Mm -hmm. She was producing for the president's wife and all his friends. So that woman was like on a high, high level. Well, Vir Virgil was luxury, too. Virgil was luxury. As yeah. a designer. It's, yeah. Who's the longest lasting luxury brand that we have? Mm. That's interesting. Now I'm thinking about these brands. There's always a stop. There's always There's a stop. Progress over there. Well, yeah. We haven't had a lot of luxury, black luxury mm -hmm. brands. Like I said. Or even brands. Christian Louboutin's black. Yeah. Virgil's black. I got, That's it. 
that I could think of. Well, Puff just got Sean John back. But that's not a luxury. I'm, I'm just saying even brands, period. Well, yeah. long, Like decades of having a brand. Right? Make Tracy Reese. She's had her brand for a long time. Okay. Um, there's just not a lot. Not a lot. No. And why do you think that that is as far as the the, the lifespan? Why is the life? Because even we've had bands that's been successful. Fubu, they made a bunch of money. We actually just have put interviewed Damon John. Yep, I saw it. Um, it was good. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. So <laughs> they they made a lot of money. Um, Sean John made a lot of money, then sold. Rockaway made money, then they sold their company. Um, so people have experienced success, right? Even Carl and I, at one point, that it was a successful brand. Absolutely. But it, it seems like it. It seems like it's a cycle where it, you start off, you know, underdog, people start to root for you and rappers start to champion it. And then you get successful and then it just becomes corny. And then it becomes like a laughing stock almost. And we had an interesting conversation with Jim Jones a few years ago, very controversial, but he had some insight onto his, his thoughts on it. What do you say? Well, he thought that all of those fashion brands in the, in the nineties and the two thousands were knockoff brands. Mm. He was like, the, they were knockoffs off of, what like he was like that the people in the culture like diddy like jay were smart enough to understand what was going on what was really moving culture and it wasn't really innovative it was more knockoff of nautica or mm -hmm. polo so he was like well why am i gonna buy this when i can just buy nautica people were disappointed how he said it because he was pretty much saying that he would rather support nautica than support mm. but I actually understand the no rationale. No comment. <laughs> but I understand it, but I understand the rationale. It was very controversial, but I do understand the rationale. That is a mindset. That's why these brands haven't been able to be successful. Because yeah. yeah. after a certain while, it's looked at as like Rockaway, like it's a joke. Yeah. Or Fubu spoof. Yeah, exactly. It's not looked at like at first it's cool, but then it's like, I'm not wearing that. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, you have to think though. You have to put a lot of money into sustaining a brand. But is that psychology? Is that outside of the money? Is that like a black psychology that we devalue things of our own? In some cases, yeah. No. In some cases, we do. But even when you just said that, I'm like, what he don't know is like some of those brands. They go to our culture, or go to the black. They went to black designers to get inspired to do what they did. Mm. Like so many of those brands that have come up, the great American brands, like got inspired by black designers yeah. from the 80s and 90s. I said there was. I didn't know what Tommy Hilfiger was before I saw Grand Poobah wear it. Straight and, up on your own TV rap. And and even in this book, like there is, you'll see some pages where basically it's like rap lyrics that we hope people will start to to say, yeah. you know, like go and spend a G on a fee shopping spree. Like, you know, like, because I'm like, we have the power to like put our black designers where they need to be, mm -hmm. especially music, like especially especially music we have that opportunity like even red carpets thank goodness more actors and actresses now are showing up on red carpets wearing black designers but like we have that power Lisa Ray I'm supporting everything right yeah. exactly yeah. I mean it's interesting because like I bring it the grand poop out thing because Ace Apple was just a, a yep. the award re recipient at, at, the, at your show they asked him who his favorite people in fashion in the history of fashion he had grand poop out Kanye West and Pharrell and then I started thinking about the conversation we were having with uh, Damon John about, yes, here in America, there is a culture, right? But hip hop culture is throughout the world. Absolutely. And so we live in a world where retro comes into to play. And so that era of the 90s, I feel like that might, I mean, if I travel to Japan, you might still be able to see it. I mean, it's coming back now. Bag, everybody wearing so baggy jeans. That's where I'm going. Yeah. So like, even like the Carl Kanaz, uh, Walk Away, Fubu, even Echo at a certain point people were, do you feel like... Did you ever wear FUBU? I never wore FUBU. Did you ever wear Echo? I did. Well, oh, no, I did. I'm not, I'm lying. I think I seen Nas wear an Esco t-shirt and I wanted that t-shirt. Did you ever wear Carcanar? I did. Huh? Going through my I'm, just, I'm just asking questions. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, and I wore Sean John and I wore... Cross Rockwell. colors. I know y'all wore cross colors. No? Cross colors, I wanted. I don't think I got it. But I was still wearing Bugle Boy at that point. I was, okay. We were too young. It was okay. too young. Okay. But I'm asking you that question because it's like, we can talk about supporting black brands, but Jim Jones, he actually, it was very controversial what he said, but it's extremely insightful. Because yeah. I never wore FUBU ever in life. Yeah. I wore Rockaway a little bit. Sean John, I wore. Um, but a lot of these black brands, 
we didn't support them. Yeah. So we can champion it, and but we got to have an honest conversation. Yeah, but I, what I was going is like, had they had the business acumen to know that, hold on to it, maybe I could license it, because that's what they did with FUBU, was be able to license it throughout the world. Yeah. Whereas now, when those brands retro into these other you know, uh, locations throughout the world, there isn't that opportunity you, anymore. You know, I think the issue is black brand. I think that Virgil cracked the code by just having a luxury brand. Mm -hmm. Once you get boxed in a corner as being a black brand, white people don't want to support it. Was, but I don't, when it came, it wasn't luxury. Virgil? Didn't. But regardless, it was never looked at as a black brand. Off-White was never looked at as a black brand. Never. Never. It was never looked at as a black brand. Mm -hmm. It was just Off-White. Even Yeezy, Yeezy, I mean, he's Kanye West, so it's easier for him to, to reach that status. But other rappers, when they put their brands out, it was like, oh, this is urban. Yeezy was just Yeezy. Yeah. And I feel like that is something that is is very important to crack that code. Because once you get put in a box as a black anything, even with us as a black media, it, it's very stifling. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that you alienate the vast majority of other people and then eventually your own people start to hate on you. Mm. You know, it, I think where we kind of mess up is, or, or where I think there's some opportunity is like creating the bridge. And like, how do you, as a bl black brand, how do you create a bridge so that you're like, basically, my brand, because at the end of the day, you want everybody to buy it, mm -hmm. right? Like, you don't want your identity to then dictate who oh, buys right. what you sell. Like, that, but that's what that's, that's so they, limiting. That's how they box you in the corner. That's what Diddy was saying with, when he, um, Diageo. That's one of his, he was like, his liquor got branded as hip hop and mm. only, and he's like, so he can't be in steakhouses and, and other restaurants. Mm. Seems like they box you in, but that happens across the board in, in every industry. It's like, if you're black, you get boxed in and that's so limiting. It is you, limiting. You're not going to yeah. be able to become Casamigos if you're just a black liquor brand. But, but Casamigos is never described as just a Mexican brand or just George Clooney. Like, you know, it's like a white brand it was never described as just, you know, a white that. brand. It's for everybody. But yeah. black brands are always described as black brands. It's true. But look at Telfar. Everybody's wearing Telfar. Incredible. Black, white, old, young, rich, poor. Just a brand. It's just a brand. And now I think the, the terminology has changed to more than just brand. It's, it's a designer. Yeah. Right. Like this is a designer. Right. Yeah. So I, I do think it's possible to be a black person, to build a brand, to build it even around black people, but to still have like a larger reach. For sure. Yeah. Well, what's <laughs> next? What's next for you? What's, your, what's, what's on the vision board for you and your company? Yeah, um, next year, we're looking to do a lot more things around consumers. So we have been very New York centric. We have like, you know, done the, the fashion thing in New York, but now we really want to go out to consumers and um, create experiences in different markets, which is why, again, investment. Yeah, we know a place. We know a place that there's a lot I'm of people. Just, <laughs> just, uh, so those, those are the types of um, experiences that, that we want to do. We're launching a podcast, Fashion and Color. We actually shoot tomorrow. Congrats. Um, Congrats. So that's coming up. Really excited about that. It's going to be on YouTube and on all um, podcast platforms. Uh, we have something coming up that we're launching for designers called HFR Verified, so that we verify designers. Um, making sure that like, you know, they have all their stuff together so that people feel great about shopping black brands. Um, we have a website, HFR and co where people can shop actually black brands sold in major retailers. So if you want to shop, want to know what black designers are sold in Nordstrom or Macy's or Bloomingdale's, um, we have that website as well. And so we're hoping that people really support that for the holidays. So, and how can people getting like, if they're designers and they want to, reach out to your company and work with um you guys as far as you know the corporate relationships so how does that process work how can they reach they can out? go um, on our website harlem's fashion row.com make sure you put an s at the end of harlem and at the very top of the website it says are you a designer 
like fill that out and then that puts you into our database you'll get all the information you need to know that's coming through the pipeline for hfr all right thank you anything else you want to say to the public before uh follow us on instagram mm -hmm. at harlem's fashion row uh me personally at brandis daniel uh, to find out you know about the the this book has not launched yet but it's about to launch small business okay. big partnerships um they can shop the fashion and color book they can go to harlemsfashionrow.com or fashionandcolorbook.com and get the book have a piece of history in your hands um but i appreciate y'all this, this is definitely going in, in the dining room thank you this is going to be i might have to get a couple copies I, I i want this to be a staple in the household Good. Thank you. For I sure. Like thank you so much. Thank you. Well, guys, thank you guys for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.